everybody, and welcome to the Whiskey Dictionary. Boy, I'm kind of used to saying Dungeons and Drams. <laughs> so, hi everybody, welcome to the Whiskey Dictionary. Uh, we are going to be talking about quite a bit of stuff today. I actually have a, a really fun show planned for you, and I've come to realize that usually when I do these live streams, they're kind of off the cuff. I'll do like the Wheel of death or doom or whatever I've decided to call it. Um, or I'll try, you know, all kinds of different stuff. Usually I just make it up off the top of my head. If I'm actually like prepping, <laughs> it's like, it's always down to the wire. No matter how much I prep, it's always like last minute. You know, I've got pages of notes here that I'm probably going to be referencing or possibly just throwing away. Uh, we'll have to see. But either way, I wanted to do something here because Irish Whiskey Month is almost over. I know I'm sad about it too. But uh, Irish Whiskey Month's almost over, and it's occurred to me, I did that, like, three-minute, you know, whiskey, Irish whiskey overview, which that video was great, and actually I was even watching it earlier today to remind myself of some of the history of Irish whiskey. But what that didn't do was actually get too much into history of Irish whiskey. What it did more is talk about, like, oh, there's these different types of Irish whiskeys, and this is what a pot still is, et cetera, et cetera. It was actually a great video. I'm, I'm going to have to do more of those little three-minute videos. They were They were pretty cool. But what I want to do tonight is talk to you guys all about the history of Irish whiskey. Um, hopefully you guys have some questions, can throw them out there if I don't know. Uh, this is the kind of thing where I think I'll probably like go figure it out because I like to know a lot about Irish whiskey. Um, and if I figure it out, I'll let you guys know in the chat. So if you're watching this in the future too and you have questions, uh, throw them down in the comments. But let's start off. Um, as you guys know, Irish whiskey is known for a few different things. So kind of the biggest ones are that it's usually very smooth, being double or triple distilled. Uh, it's usually a little sweet, if not just kind of like easy to adapt. And because of that, it takes very well to finishing as well. But these are where it is now. Where whiskey came from is somewhere, uh, Irish whiskey, is somewhere completely different. And some of the stuff you guys are going to know, some of the stuff you won't know, some of you will know more about it than even I do. But where I want to start off is monks, right? Monastic society. So it's commonly believed that Irish whiskey came from monks who, uh, this part you might not have known, they learned the art of distillation from making perfume. And it's believed that they kind of learned how to make whiskey from the Moors over in um, uh, Mediterranean. I was going to say Mesopotamia, which is a much different place um, and much different time frame. Over in the Mediterranean, they're believed to have picked up how to distill things over there. And then they kind of traveled across Europe, eventually made it over to Ireland, and they started distilling whiskey. Now, they did this in a way to make medicines um and that was that was kind of the big thing but actually what what is commonly believed is that as they were making perfume i mean perfume smells good who's not gonna try to taste it and see if it tastes good too right um so there's a small belief that maybe some of them drank some perfume and uh noticed that it kind of made them feel a little funny and didn't kill them <laughs> so, and when you consider some of the things that they would actually distill way back then, I actually just recently was learning about, um, there's this very, uh, strong smelling fish sauce that was very popular in Rome. And it was by, basically you just, you, you ferment fish, <laughs> fish oils and guts, and then they used it as a sauce. Um, and that kind of whole concept of fermentation and whatever else, that all goes together and it was all around the same time so all right this is where i wanted to start when you think about kind of the oldest version of irish whiskey there's a thing called uh potine now it is called potine uh it's spelled in a way p-o-i-t-i-o-n or something it's it's spelled it kind of looks like potion kind of looks like poutine um but it's potine and the reason they call it that is actually it's based off the uh small word uh, a word that means small pot and this is basically saying like hey we distilled this thing in a small copper pot so if you want to think about potine you're going to be thinking about moonshine it's a very similar concept now i got this one from a friend of mine who went to ireland and he uh, brought it back to me just obviously knowing what i what i enjoy and this is from a place i know nothing about it so I, this could be junk i have no clue but i don't have any other potine on me so this is molly gallivan's fine irish potine the spirit of ireland blah 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 um it looks like yeah triple distilled in the hills of ireland that's all that it needs to be and it's just this little guy here um 
let's see where I'm not really sure where my focus is so I guess it's way back here on my face uh, but whatever all right so I'm gonna pour this and we're gonna kind of drink this and talk just a little bit more about monks and such <laughs> I know I can't think of the Moors without thinking of the moops from Seinfeld <laughs> it was the moops <laughs> the moops Jerry yeah oh such a classic episode um so one of the things that I, I'll kind of go into this in just a minute. One thing you're going to notice about Pauteen as well is that it is similar to Moonshine, but it's actually based off of slightly different inclusions um, that give it a different taste and, and fragrance. Um, so actually, I guess I'll just kind of do a little bit, have a sip, uh, settle in here, and then we'll, we'll continue. I have a, just a metric ton of stuff to kind of go through tonight. This is actually going to be one of those times where hopefully you walk away and you'll you'll know some more stuff. So if, let me even just say, and I'm, I will get to this, I promise. Um, if you guys have any sort of Irish whiskey, I sure hope that you're drinking along with me. I'll even tell you, tonight I'm going to be drinking this poteen. Uh, Bushmills, Jameson, McConnell's, Powers, Redbreast, uh, Spot Whiskey, and Teeling. So if you have any of those, those would be what I would have you gravitate towards. If you don't have any of those, I would suggest going for anything pot stilled. And then if you don't have any of those, get whatever you have. But try to drink an Irish whiskey with me. <laughs> um, yes, Donald. I know. Crazy, huh? All right. So the thing with uh, Potteen is that you're going to get different smells than you would typically get off of moonshine where moonshine does uh, i'm saying moonshine but let's just say unaged whiskey right um unaged whiskey has usually a very sharp if not very like short lasting smell and usually kind of a strong taste with not a whole lot of flavor um i don't know this potine again but what it could taste like is everything from strawberries to grain um, it could go, it could really have a whole range of flavors and I am excited. So let's just have a sip and, uh, we'll say cheers. And even though it's not quite over yet, I have had a good Irish whiskey month this month. I actually think the, the videos have been pretty, pretty fun to film. So cheers everybody. Hmm. Hmm. That's pretty, t oh, that's really good. Actually, the finish on that is where this one shines, uh, which I'm surprised. Because as I just said, the finish isn't always really there. Uh, this one does have a light fruity finish. And um, I, the alcohol is probably 46%, I want to say. I think that's what I saw earlier. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. Actually, it's not listed on here, so I'm not sure where I saw that. Uh, but let's just say, I mean, it's drinking like a 43 to 46%. So I'll put it somewhere in that range. So cool running. I I was just talking about that. So I've seen it. I could be wrong. I don't believe I am in this case. I've seen it pronounced Puchin, um, and that's how I've been saying it up until literally today, where I learned about the etymology of the word, and it seems as if it's actually. I mean, I will one hundred percent change my mind if you tell me that you live in Ireland and you'd rather call it Puchin. I'll change it right now. But it seems as if it's pronounced Pauteen. That being said, I think Poutine sounds better, and I'd rather call it that, so I will totally go with it. So anybody, feel free to correct me. All right, so some of the things that the monks were originally using whiskey for are kind of what you'd expect, and some of, uh, frankly, it's some of the things that we pretend that it's good for now. <laughs> um, for example, uh you know, help you with digestion. You want to eat it after or drink it after you have a meal. Um, it actually, oddly enough, it was for uh, headaches, which I've always found whiskey to give me more headaches than help fix. But then again, if I have a hangover and I drink a little whiskey, it's probably going to feel better. Um, but so pain relief, antiseptic, which that makes sense. You know, you've seen a dozen movies, I'm sure, of people pouring whiskey on a wound that's infected or not infected, but, you know, fresh wound. Um, cold and flu remedy, sleep aid, <laughs> of course. <laughs> and then I can't tell you how many times after a live stream I have gone sat on the couch and fallen asleep instead of going to bed. Um, and then anesthetic. <laughs> I like it. I, I will pronounce it Pootie Tang. I think that'd be all right. <laughs> If you can get your hands on any of this mystery liquid that we're, we're unsure about the name, um, I would suggest it. I think that 
it, think of like the Buffalo Trace. They did the unaged whiskey somewhat recently. That was, in my opinion, it was like fine. Um, it wasn't great, but unaged whiskey is never really going to be fantastic. It's a good way to experience what something is before it's aged, but you know, it's never going to be your favorite whiskey on the shelf, most likely. Uh, let's just see. Good evening, gents. Hey, Donald. Um, all right. So, uh, okay. This was cool. So, Pucci <laughs> I'm just going to say Puccine Puccine, because that's what I've been calling it for years, and I, I don't want to be that guy. So, let's go Puccine. Um, Puccine has an interesting legal history, uh, and with many things, taxation is kind of what did it in, but also regulation. So, even back in the mid-1600s, I think 1661, uh, making Puccine was made illegal. And part of it was that there is no good way to know what's going into it. It's actually a big reason why making moonshine is illegal, um, other than, again, tax, because Uncle Sam's got to get his piece. But in this case, Uncle Patty <laughs> needs to get his piece. <laughs> so uh, anyway, so in 1661, they made it illegal to make poutine. It didn't really stop anybody. Uh, but at that point, they kind of moved into the woods, and they would distill things out there and... Um, at that point, they were also kind of leaning more into, well, if it's illegal anyway, we're going to cut corners where we can because we're already taking a lot of risk. We might as well make as much money as we can. So this is an interesting part because people were still making whiskey illegally. And because of that, eventually some whiskeys became more popular and well-known and it was more just people would turn a blind eye to it, like even the government. And that's where we're kind of going to get into our next um, little bit. But just one last piece about Puccine. In 1997 is when they finally legalized Puccine creation. And they put all of the typical regulations that you would have around things that were coming around in the late 90s. And uh, now it's a thing that is kind of coming back. Um, not a huge surprise. People like hipsters and <laughs> whatnot, they they look for the old stuff and then they try to make it their own. I will tell you that this poutine here tastes a little bit like a fancy gin uh, to me. So, yeah, Uncle Seamus, I like that. Mm. Thank you, Steve. Appreciate that. Uh, Steve says he really enjoys March and uh, shame so many others don't get it. Yeah, I totally agree with you. And I, I will also say, like, there are Irish whiskeys out there. Um, there's a lot of Irish whiskeys. And at the moment, because of just the industry and the way it is, there are there is a lot of similarity between a lot of them. But why I like Irish whiskey is because I see a lot of promise in it. And every time that a new release of Irish whiskey comes out, I have high hopes that it's going to be the one that is, like, uh, for lack of a better, like the next Jameson. It's going to be the next big thing that really takes over. Um, so I, I think that there's a lot of promise in future Irish whiskey. All right. So um, let me just double check real quick. Uh, I have, like I said, I have a lot of notes, so I'm going to be checking these a lot. Um, <laughs> I found this was kind of funny. Puccine has a, a very strong reputation for being very fast acting <laughs> so when people would start to make it you also have to imagine that whiskey was just becoming kind of a thing and whiskey's gonna hit you a lot harder than beer <laughs> a lot faster so imagine this clear liquid that kind of looks like water all of a sudden you're drunk <laughs> that's gotta be kind of a wild concept all right so um we're gonna move along to uh 1608 now there was a guy, uh, actually, I'm going to, I forget which whiskey. Oh, okay. So there's a guy named uh, Sir Thomas Phillips. Now, Sir Thomas Phillips was, as I was alluding to, one of these people who decided to make whiskey anyway and did a really good job at it. And because he did such a good job at it, he was granted the first license to actually make whiskey. Now, I'm interested in the chat. I'm going to not give this away quite yet. Um... Which distillery did Sir Thomas Phillips have a hand in creation of? Like, where did where did it start? Uh, I'll give you a couple seconds, and I'll give you a hint. But, um, let's see. Yeah, so he got the first ever license. It was granted by the king. Um, and it was mostly because the king really, really enjoyed his whiskey. Uh, okay, so here's your hint. It's made from Northern Ireland.
Bushmills. Excellent. Yep, he owned the land. Uh, so, perfect. Yep, so we're going to drink some Bushmills 10 tonight. Now, obviously, Bushmills original would be closer to what we were going to be getting way back when. Um, I have the 10 here. I haven't actually cracked this open in a very long time. Uh, probably like four years. So, I thought instead of pouring the 12, which is what I wanted a little bit more, I thought I would go back to the 10 and just kind of experience that again and see if I like it. Which I imagine I will, because it's whiskey. Excuse me. So... Okay, so with uh, Sir Thomas Phillips basically creating uh, or be, having a hand in Bushmills and the growth of Bushmills, Bushmills is, it, it kind of set the precedent for being able to have a legitimate whiskey business that the government could tax. And suddenly this was showing to be very profitable for the government and more licenses came along, <laughs> but it had been a few years. Um, so let's go ahead. And this this part's kind of small, but Bushmills is absolutely worth mentioning if you're going to be talking about the history of whiskey. Um, so anyway, let's go ahead and have a sip. Cheers. Mm. Oh, Bushmills Prohibition. Excellent. We're actually going to be talking a little bit about the Prohibition in, in the temperance movement and all that. Um so this is, uh, this is interesting. It's Like I said, it's been a long time. I don't have any of my notes in front of me, which is totally fine because it's fun to just taste things and have a little bit less pressure. Um, the number one thing I'm tasting here is a very sweet and like green apple. Um, bit of a sharp finish, which actually after having the poutine, it's, you can kind of see a little similarity there. And I'm wondering if that's on purpose that it would have kind of, most likely Bushmills would have been created by people who had been brewing, uh, distilling out in the woods <laughs> and, you know, bring in some of the experts. Uh, this is interesting. I, I'm i happy that I tried that first because seeing that connection is something I don't think I've actually done before. So very cool. Yes, profitable for the government in London, um, but they were the ones calling the shots too. <laughs> and I, I will not be getting into any sort of uh, political stuff in this episode. Um because, boy, do the, <laughs> is that not a friendly rivalry. Okay, so um, let's go to the 18th century. Uh, so we had quite a few distilleries cropping up. And w at this point, we're kind of seeing the growth of Irish whiskey in the culture of Ireland. Now, it had always been a bit of a thing back with the, the poutine and whatnot because it was, like, on the outskirts. And people would probably try it. It was medicine whatever but now you've got real whiskey distilleries making real whiskey and it's flowing to the to the pubs to wherever you want it to be and because of this it found its way into folklore and uh you know it'd be part of telling stories um clearly if we're gonna go stereotypical ireland is known for drinking and a big part of that is irish whiskey um obviously beer <laughs> as well but yeah irish whiskey is going to be a huge part of this so people would be distilling this stuff even in their houses and at one point ireland had over 2,000 distilleries now just for a comparison i think last year when i uh, looked at the most recent count there were 38 or 40 distilleries currently but for a very long time there were 9 to 13 um so we crashed after those 2,000 distilleries. Um, and a big reason for that, again, was regulation. You ended up having a whole lot of people making their own whiskeys that couldn't be sold legally, and they were getting kind of shut down. Um, so then you had a whole bunch of these regular real distilleries, and then they were making their stuff. Sorry. All right. So, um Again, taxes. I, I really, like, took a lot of notes, and almost every single one of these points <laughs> mentions taxes and regulation because a lot of people were just making their own stuff pretty much all the time. But exporting Irish whiskey became a big thing, too. Obviously, Scotland what had been exporting uh, Johnny Walker, actually, pretty much everywhere in the world. But Ireland followed suit, and they started shipping all over the place as much as they could, and that was going really, really well for them. This is in that time frame where there were a ton of distilleries. 
But what happened was the temperance movement and prohibition in America and all of these things that kind of put the kibosh on everything whiskey coming into the United States, who at this point we had a whole lot of immigrants coming over. I actually wore my Cape Cod hoodie um, specifically to kind of it's I don't have a Boston hoodie because uh, I'm not a big, huge sports fan. Um, but it was closest I had. And, you know, up here in, in uh, Boston area, we have a ton of Irish. And that's because everybody immigrated here. And they started working. And huge uh, Irish whiskey fanatics up here. And just even in this area, we love Irish whiskey. So. Sorry, sometimes I actually have to stop and just sip my whiskey because it's good. Uh, let's see. So. One thing that also helped to legitimize whiskey in the Irish whiskey, oh, sorry, in Ireland, was this fact that it was made by monks. If you're now thinking about the 18th century, you're also thinking back at least 200 years when this stuff was created or brought to Ireland. And 200 years is a long time, especially to small town folk. And the idea that this thing is made by monks and it's like, this religious thing it helped to kind of solidify the idea that irish whiskey was worth having and should belong in the world um so anybody trying to shut this down is is almost like you kind of almost have this like religious uh excuse to drink your whiskey now too um think like drinking wine at, at church you know like if they i think that they kind of did away with that after covid um but for a long time growing up you know me going to church and everything it was always wine 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 could just as well have been whiskey um, as far as this goes. Okay, so I'm going to pick a, another whiskey here that kind of embodies more what you would have seen in the 18th century. Um, now, I'm picking Green Spot mostly because it's uh, pot stilled. I don't remember when the spot whiskeys became a thing. Uh, I don't think it was during the 18th century, but it was. I think it was early 19th century is what I would say. Is that true? I'm not sure. Um, somebody, if anybody wants to fact check that, I'm not. Put, I'm. I'm just get, doing this part off the top of my head. I didn't take any notes on this, but. <laughs> um, as far as spot whiskeys go, I want to say it was like the early 1900s, like 1927, something like that, when uh, it became a became a thing. So, either way, this is a pot still whiskey. And it is much more reminiscent of what they would have been making at the time. Although I'm sure this tastes quite a bit better. All right, so cheers. Hmm. All right, now, while I sip on this, we're gonna go into the 19th century. And this is what I would call the golden age of whiskey, if you exclude like today. Because um, frankly, I don't think whiskey has been popular enough to really consider this a an age of whiskey. Um, I just like I think if whiskey stays very popular for another 50 years, we might consider this as like the second coming of whiskey. Uh, but for the moment, let's think of the golden age of whiskey. This is when some of the bigger names started making whiskey like Jameson Powers. Um, uh, let's see. I'm looking. Uh, oh, actually, so. I have one over here that we're going to talk about called McConnell's. Now, McConnell's has recently been reinvigorated by somebody. I haven't done enough research on it to really know much about it, but McConnell's used to be a whiskey a long, long time ago. Uh, so that's over here as well. But we're going to end up drinking the Powers. <laughs> yeah, look at my old, old box here. Um, I meant to review this one like four or five years ago, and I never did. Uh, so we have the Powers 3 Swallow. We have the McKellen's. Uh, sorry, McConnell's. And then we have Jameson as well. And we're going to drink all three of these very shortly. And many of you know that the concept of Irish whiskey, after the temperance movement and the and prohibition and everything, really put a damper on uh, whiskey sales. And then you follow it with, you know, World War I and World War II. Like, all of these things together, you probably know this, but... Irish whiskey was suffering, and because of this, they kind of put all of their eggs in one basket, and many distilleries, or a few distilleries, I should say, grouped together, and they formed the Irish distillers, and that's when they they really pushed hard for Jameson, and Jameson became kind of this iconic figure. Now, whereas we have in the United States, we have like Jack Daniels, which is more well-known just because they have really good marketing, and like everybody drinks it in their 20s. And I mean, nowadays they have good whiskey too, but like old number seven has graced many of our palates across our 
more innocent years. Uh, Jameson isn't just known because it's like a good party drink. It's known because it saved Irish whiskey. And because of that, it was the Irish distillers that, that all came together and just decided to push this one thing. <laughs> I know, right? If you want to talk about the big four of Dublin, you need to include Rowan Co. Thank you. I actually had them written down, and I don't think it made it to this version of um, because I couldn't, I didn't have time to research Rowan Co. Uh, so Donald, thank you for bringing them up. They've shut down. Um, unless I'll let you be the expert in this. In this case, uh, Donald, tell me if any of this is wrong. So Rowan Co. Made whiskey. Um, they were one of these. They were the fourth distillery that joined together for Irish distillers. But then they shut down. And then they don't make it anymore. As far as I know, that's correct. They do not exist anymore. Um, I don't know what they made. <laughs> so I don't know enough about them to include them. But thank you for bringing that up because I would have absolutely glossed over that. Okay. Uh, let's see. So during this golden age, um, a man named Anus. <laughs> not Anus. Jeez. I even told myself, don't call him Anus. It's like Anius, or it's like A-E-N-U-S, or something like that. He created the coffee still. Now, the coffee still, you've seen pictures of this before. It's these two vertical columns, or potentially one, but it should work as two vertical columns. And it is the uh, analyzer column and the rectifier. Um, the idea being that you can make whiskey continuously and it will be of a similar quality and you don't really end up with like the heads or tails that you get when you're doing a pot still. I, you know, that's why I was so hemming and hawing, Donald. I knew, I knew that Rowan Co. would end up being relaunched. Like with the way that Irish whiskey is being lately, where they're everybody and their brother is starting up a whis Irish distillery. To lean on a name like that made perfect sense. So hearing Diageo is doing that, not a huge surprise. But again, I'm not going to pretend I knew that or pretend any knowledge about it. But I will look it up because I'd like to know. All right, so you've got your coffee still. Now, this is ironically not really adopted in Ireland. <laughs> Most people just stuck with the pot still. Uh, but the coffee still ended up becoming very popular across the world. Um, I would... I wouldn't say most famously for in Japanese whiskey because other people did it first. Uh, but, you know, you've heard of Nika coffee whiskey. That is made with a coffee still. Um, many other whiskeys are made with a coffee still as well, especially if they intend on making... I don't want to group things too broadly, but, like, it doesn't have the same flavor as a pot still. And in my opinion, it's used more for mass quantity than it is anything else. So... Okay, so uh, I won't go too much into the, the coffee still. I have <laughs> a bunch of notes here that I took that are completely useless where I talk about, all about the coffee still. But frankly, that sounds boring to me. I'd rather do that in a real video where I talk about the coffee stills. Um, is that, by the way, like, I feel like I'm missing the mark a lot lately with my videos. So I'm, I'm curious, just since I have you guys here, I would like to do some other videos where uh, it's more like education focused, um, you know, kind of like I used to do where it was like the info and the buying guys guides. Would you guys be interested in learning, like, actual in-depth about different types of stills? Or is that boring? I, I truly don't know. Um, I would want to look it up because I feel like I should know more about it than I do. And usually that is my onus to make videos on topics is, oh, I'm interested about this. Let me learn everything I could possibly learn about it and then make a video about it and promptly forget everything. <laughs> so let me know if that's something that you guys would be interested in. Uh, the first large-scale commercial coffee still was installed at Old Powers John's Lane Distillery. Uh, they had to convince the others in IDL to adopt grain whiskey. Yeah, um, I read about that as well, actually. But uh, more, I guess what I was getting at is the coffee still didn't really get the adoption across Ireland that it could have, especially considering it was started in Ireland. All right, so uh, I'm going to move on from, what is, what is it that I'm, oh, geez, green spot. I didn't realize how fast I would be going through all these whiskeys. Um, because we're doing the Golden Age, I wanted to do <laughs> Powers Gold. I don't have it, but I thought it would be at least close enough to do the Powers 3 Swallow. Uh, this is another one that I have not had in quite a while, uh, as you can tell by the box. And the fact that it's barely touched. Um, so let's go ahead and pour the Powers 3 Swallow. Let's see. 
All right, so Alex is interested in the the still concept, but um, you're probably right. I don't know that it would be like a hugely viewed video. Uh, what you need to do is review Wild Turkey 101 every week like some channels and put it in a goofy thumbnail. You are completely correct, uh, but I'm not going there because I'm going to be more positive this year. <laughs> All right. I have not had this in a very long time, but I will tell you, every time Irish Whiskey come uh, year month, sorry, Irish Whiskey Month comes along, people say you have to review Three Swallow, and they're not wrong. I know I need to, and the main reason I haven't is because I can't bring this out on the video and be like, "Hey, everybody, I have you know powers Three Swallow," because they'd be like, "That bo bottle hasn't been made in years." <laughs> not that the recipe has changed. But I can't, I, like, if I'm doing it on the channel, I need to have the new bottle. I just don't want to buy it yet. All right. Cheers. Hmm. Hmm. This is very good. Um, so, Donald, let me ask you a question, only because I didn't look this up. Is this... All right. So, single pot still Irish whiskey. Okay. Um, it's funny because I was going to say, is this a single pot still Irish whiskey? Because it tastes like it. But then when you were just talking about um, Powers having the column stills, it made me question myself. Um, whiskey has been matured primarily in American bourbon barrels and the subtle inclusion of whiskey matured in Olorosa sherry casks. That makes sense why I like it. I am such a sucker for anything in sherry casks. All right, cool. Joe, thank you. Um, I've only had Powers once. I think it was Three Swallow, but I remember it being pretty good. All right. This is very good. I, I will say I had a Powers on the channel a long time ago. Um, I'm trying to remember. Did I ever? I don't know if I actually ever reviewed Clontarf. <laughs> There's a whiskey called Clontarf, which is just the best. Like, best name. Mm. I totally agree. I, I like this bottle look way more than the current ones i hate the new marketing um uh and i i'm like i dislike marketing people <laughs> i guess because i feel like they do things for absolutely no real reason um but and no offense to anybody out there watching i'm more just telling you why uh but in the case of this like this looks good um the other ones look like i don't know kind of remind me I wish I had a picture readily available. The The way that the Powers bottles look now remind me of what, um, in the fifth element, what the, the main character there was wearing, the, the like, white thing. <laughs> you guys know what I'm talking... Anybody who's seen that movie knows what I'm talking about. Um, but the strappy thing. Uh, it's It looks like you took a, bo a bottle and put it into that, that uh, chamber, and then it came out with all the strappies on it. <laughs> Freedom Vault gets what I'm saying. <laughs> mm. So, interesting... Uh, well, Alex, I, I actually think that's a great topic. Um, I have to imagine that would make a really good short. Because I can't fathom talking about that for like five minutes. <laughs> um, yes, they do. They look like craft gin bottles and they look cheap. Alright, cool. I'm glad I'm not alone in that. It's part of the reason that I haven't, like wanted to buy the new one um although at this point what the hell why would i keep the cover what do i think i need that for i'm totally the guy that keeps boxes to stuff that i i open to um so anyway all right let's continue all right so we talked coffee still um i drank a little powers so uh okay the temperance movement i don't need to go too much into that but i will uh just a little bit um, American Prohibition. Okay, we talked about that. Okay, so I I talked a bit about how Jameson, sorry, not yeah, how Jameson helped to keep Irish whiskey alive. Um, so I think it's fair to drink. I didn't want to drink the regular. I've had it very recently. I wanted to drink the Black Barrel because I wanted to. I think the Black Barrel is a considerable improvement upon the original, and I actually really like the original. And I'm going to tell you guys a story about regular Jameson. Uh, this is a, a story about, like, me. <laughs> so it's not about Irish whiskey history, uh, but it's just a fun one. And while I'm taking a, a sip or two, I think this will be a fun story. Um, Longtime viewers probably would have heard this, but I don't care. So on my – I'm 40. Um, I got married when I was 30 by, like, 
two months, I think. Um, so this actually, I might have been 29 when, when my bachelor party happened. Um, so my brother-in-law rented a beach house. And the beach house was uh, in Sandwich, Massachusetts. So it's it's on Cape Cod. And basically, it was, it was like a multi-million dollar house that he rented for a night. And he invited a bunch of friends and, and whatever. And it was, like, amazing. And even just waking up the next morning despite the hangover, which I'll get into in a sec, um, the room that I was in had these giant glass windows that just looked over the ocean and the sun was coming up over the it was uh, incredible um but the night prior uh it included a whole lot of fun stuff including me eating a ribeye with a buck knife and just or actually i wouldn't even say a buck knife the thing was even bigger than a buck it was like it was like this big i have a picture of me like eating a piece of steak with it um we ended up having a fire on the beach and as you would imagine, we were all drinking beers. And one of the things that my brother-in-law asked people, he said, hey, in lieu of like any sort of present or whatever you have in mind, um, Bill really likes whiskey. This was actually before I started the channel. And so he said, anybody who wants to bring a bottle of whiskey, that would be awesome. And Bill will really appreciate it. So I got a few bottles of whiskey that day, including Angel's Envy. Um, and my father-in-law, or, or soon to be at the time, he ended up bringing me a bottle of Jameson. And it was a small bottle. It was actually... Um, so it wasn't the same bottle because that one's long gone, but it was this exact bottle, like the size. And so you could see why at one point during the night I confused this for a beer. And I was quite surprised when, you know, I, I think it was already open. I think somebody handed it to me, actually. They were like, oh, hey, here's your beer. And it was already open. And so I was just like, oh, it's my beer. And I, I like turned it up and I just drank, drank, drank. And... In hindsight, probably had, probably had like two full of these, as a couple of gulps, and boy did that happen fast, <laughs> and it was kind of the beginning of the end for me for that night, um, but that was a really fun time. So Jameson has a bit of a, a spot in my heart as far as something I really enjoy, but I will say all of this to get to Jameson Black Barrel is a significant improvement over the regular Jameson, and for not considerably more money if you've never had it it is super worth it sorry cheers okay so um okay so i don't really feel like talking about the temperance movement. you guys know about prohibition you know what happened you know it was a shameful moment in the american history man that's a good whiskey um but what this allowed for was also some illicit uh whiskey distilling out in the woods again uh people were continuing to make irish whiskey even though uh they weren't selling it and this is when we had that huge crash of all of the dis uh, distilleries kind of ending um i'm kind of going back in time here a little bit sorry for the the uh what is it shoot Pulp Fiction. What's it? Quentin Tarantino? Sorry for Tarantinoing it. All right, let's let's go into the 20th century revival. Is what I called this. Um, so we talked about that. Explain the. Hmm. Okay, I think I'm I'm looking over my notes, and I'm thinking about what's actually worth mentioning here because. Although the timing is, is about right, I want to make sure I get to everything here. And I, I have something I want to wrap up with, too. Um, just give me, sorry to, to be, like, looking at a piece of paper. But, all right. Uh, okay. Um, okay. I think the only things that are really worth mentioning at this point as far as history are, are things like more recent history. If you ever want a really cool story, you should check out the one of John Jameson's sons. Yeah, you know, I specifically didn't include that because I didn't think it was super relevant. Um, but since you brought it up, <laughs> so John Jameson's son uh, went on a, I wouldn't call it a safari. He went on an expedition. And um, you guys have heard this story on the channel before. He ended up uh, paying for a slave uh, girl. Basically, it was like a 12-year-old girl. And he paid for her, not in the way that you might be thinking. He wanted to see her eaten, uh, as in cannibalism, because he wanted to sketch it. Um, and I, if I remember correctly, what he traded for her life were like th three or four handkerchiefs, um, basically little pieces of cloth, right? And uh, there's like all these sketches. I'll kind of save you the, the, the 
gory details um despite the fact that we're all adults but it's just it's like depressing to talk about i guess maybe because i have girls uh for like i have two daughters um but in general yeah the dude's like kind of a piece of crap um it was being offered to him I, from what i understand of the story he didn't just walk over to some tribe and be like hey i'm gonna pay you some handkerchiefs for one of your kids so that i can watch you eat it and sketch it they were like oh hey like this is a thing that we think we might do pay us so i don't know i mean it, it's like 200 years ago what are we gonna do um anyway yeah guy's kind of a piece of garbage <laughs> And by kind of, a, I don't think I'm offending anybody by saying a dude who paid uh, people to eat a child was, is a piece of garbage. Yeah. Um, anyway. All right. So current day, um, the past was the worst. <laughs> yeah. You know, it, people could kind of, here's what I find interesting about that story. It's, it's an event like, all right, let's say that you're the guy that wants to do that. And you want to sketch it because you just have a morbid curiosity. I mean, I've watched some pretty awful videos on on the internet. I've seen some horrific things. Out of curiosity and also out of being tricked by my friends into watching it because hilarity. Um, we've all seen Two Girls, One Cup. But I've seen far worse. Anyway. <laughs> this dude is like historically known for that. That's what his legacy is. What a piece of garbage. Anyway. Hmm. Love me some black barrel. Okay, let's move on. So I'm going to drink a couple more of these. We're going to talk about them real quick. And we're going to talk about the current day's resurgence. I'm going to skip the Red Breast 12 because you guys have seen me drink that more times than I can count. Um, but we are going to talk about Teeling because uh, Teeling is important. And we're going to talk about this McConnell. Uh, mostly because... I actually just, for not for nothing, I don't think I'm going to get to a review on this one. And I think you guys should should pick this McConnell's up. It's like $35. And it is a very solid Irish whiskey for that price. Um, so in current day, as you've heard, we have gone from roughly nine distilleries that are, like, functioning um, to about 40 in the last, say, 10 years. That is a huge increase, and Irish whiskey is currently growing faster than any other brand or any other category in the world. And I, for one, am very happy about it, of course. But one brand that I really think sticks out is Teeling. Um, Teeling started in 2012, and when they did, I, I mean, uh, some of the details escaping me. One of the things about trying to recap a whole bunch of like data and facts is when you're drinking and <laughs> trying to do it. You, some of the bits get a little fuzzy. Um, Teeling is named after somebody who had something to do with um, Middleton, I believe. Uh, I think it was like like John Teeling. I'm going to bet it was John Teeling. I'm sorry for not being as factual about this. I actually didn't write this part down because I wasn't sure I was going to talk about it. Um, but either way, Teeling is, is not named for like the recent dude named Teeling who started the Teeling. It's named for somebody historical. Um, and they have some really, really good whiskeys. One of them is the Black Pits that uh, won Whiskey of the Year a few years ago on Whiskey Advocate. And I agree. I think it was a very, I, I don't know that I'd call it Whiskey of the Year, but I think it was a very good whiskey. And it was interesting. It was a peated Irish whiskey, and there aren't very many of those, at least not that make it out of the country. And it was very good. Um, so Teeling in general, if you are looking for one, uh, small batch is a great choice to start off with. Um, some of their higher end stuff, I, I don't think I've had a Teeling I haven't liked. I tried the 24 year somewhat recently. I was a little let down when I considered the price versus you know taste, but it was still good. It just wasn't spectacular, especially I think I think I wanted like 400 something dollars for that. Um, not quite worth it. All right, let's have a sip of the Teeling. This is such a beautiful flavor. It's very complex, especially on the finish. Um, there's, there, is this, hold on, sorry, give me two seconds here. Uh, sorry, I was looking for something specific. Um, Teeling has, their small batch is one of the, one of the better Irish whiskeys out there, in my opinion. I would even put it, on par with like some of the spot whiskeys, which are easily twice the price. 
um, as far as just being very flavorful and fun to explore. John, it was John Teeling. Okay, I wasn't out of my mind. And Donald, I'm so happy that you're here. I actually, part of me wanted to kind of have you on this episode, but I didn't think about doing this until literally last night. And when I was like, oh, it'd be fun to go through the history. And I, I didn't want to put you on the spot like that. Um, so jo- uh, Donald says, John Teeling sold Cooley to Beam Suntory and his sons to, <laughs> got to keep 17,000 casts. That's right. Uh, and his sons, Jack and S- Stephen, or Stefan, uh, run Teeling down in Dublin, which... While well, he now runs Great Northern, thank you for that. I, it's funny. I've done these reviews on so many things, and this data is in my brain, but not accessible anymore. Like reading that, I'm like, I remember all of that, but I would not have been able to recall it. Anyway, so if you're thinking about picking up an Irish whiskey, Teeling is definitely one I would suggest. I'm gonna drink this in a little bit once I end the stream. Um, actually, that's one of the best parts about doing these streams. I end up with like seven whiskeys, and I take them upstairs, sit on the couch. And drink them all. Um, so this McConnell here, I was at a liquor store somewhat recently, and I asked the person who was working there, who actually I found out later is not the owner, but she's like a color, color like the, you know, general manager or something like that. Um, and I said, hey, what Irish whiskey are people really excited about this year? And I told her what I did, and we actually had a very long conversation. It was nice, and she let me try a few things, et cetera, et cetera. And she suggested this McConnell. She says, every time that this goes on the shelf, it's gone. And I was like, why is that? And she said, because it's $35, and it's really good. And it seemed like something I should tell you guys about. So uh, we're going to end tonight's episode, uh, even though a little early. I, I don't really care. Doing the whole hour-long thing. I'd rather just do what feels right and not push things. Um, the McConnell's here is another one that I would highly suggest that you pick up. Um, it's in this newer wave of Irish whiskeys. It is a resurgence of an old brand um, I know nothing about, but I suspect is probably not all that similar in taste. Um, it tastes more to me like a, co- a current day Irish whiskey. Uh, but anyway, let's have a sip. Cheers. It does need a little bit more time in the barrel, if I'm being honest. But when you reflect back on the price, it tastes a little metallic. But other than that, it has a very long finish. And it's it's kind of like one or two tone. where But those two tones are pretty, pretty nice and just kind of enjoyable to drink. Anyway, all right. So um, my personal opinion of Irish whiskey, I, I obviously love it. Uh, I think it's something that needs to be celebrated, something that needs to be concentrated on. And if you find yourself as somebody who enjoys it and is drinking it now, I think that you will have a better view of what it was versus what it could be in a couple of years. Think of, for example, a lot of times people comment on how scotch used to be better, you know, 10, 15 years ago. And I think we're going to see that same thing happen to Irish whiskey now where even things as simple as Jameson are going to be better today than they are in 10 or 15 years. So anyway, I think that you should get into Irish whiskey now. I think you should drink as much of it as you possibly can. There's, if you're like a bit of a completionist and you want to try them all, it's actually attainable. <laughs> so it's something to, to try for. All right. Anyway, that does it for tonight's episode on uh, the history of Irish whiskey. I hope you guys learned something. Um, a lot of the stuff about the monks I found to be very interesting um especially the stuff about the poutine as well because i just simply had never tried that so i thought that was very cool uh but aside from that i hope you guys had a good time donald thank you for all of the uh little tidbits of info and and helping me to uh run the the stream tonight and uh, to everybody else i'll see you um actually i'm gonna put out a video on friday this is my new thing i'm gonna live stream on mondays and put out my videos on fridays it took me a little while to figure out my time frame um but i appreciate everybody who jumped into the stream tonight and i hope you guys all have a great rest of your night cheers And now I get to awkwardly sit here while I try to hit the button. And there it is. Cheers.